welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 244. For this one, we're playing cash games in Biloxi, Mississippi at the Beau Rivage. Uh, awesome episode, you guys are gonna love it. Before we get started, a couple of things I wanna talk about. The first is that we have our Lodge Relaunch Week going on right now, so I'm probably playing some massive stakes while you're watching this, potentially. Uh, we're playing 50, 100, and 200, 400 every day on stream. So that's gonna be awesome. Be sure to check that out. I have a link down below in the description box for the Lodge's YouTube channel. And then I have some big trips coming up. So I'm going out to the Triton series in Vietnam. I'll be there probably starting, let's see, March 1st. Um, I'll be there for about a week. And then I'm going out to Cambodia. I'm not sure exactly what day I'm gonna arrive in Cambodia for the WPT yet, but um, probably around the 8th or 9th. And I'll be there throughout like the remainder of the series. So I'm gonna be there for around two weeks. Um, we're likely gonna do a meetup game. We don't have anything set in stone yet for uh, for Cambodia, but as soon as we have the details down, I'll put them below in the description box and you can follow me on social media for uh, more details as well. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Mississippi. I've known how to spell the state's name for literally decades, but I've never been here. This is my view of the Gulf from my room at the Beau Rivage. It's an MGM property. I'm here mostly for the Million Dollar Heater Tournament Series, which is their biggest one of the year, and always brings in lots of cash game action. The night of arrival, Andrew and I host a little meet and greet at the Top Golf on site. A couple dozen viewers come out to say hi and have some food and drinks. Then it's time for poker. Well, Andrew and I play a little three card poker first, which I've only played a few times in my life. Then it's time for real poker. All the games are uncapped, which is part of what makes them special. We sit down to 2-5 with 2,600 total while we wait for 5-10-25. I bought in for 2,000 chips inside the poker room, and the remaining 600 is what I took over from the three-card poker table. We get started just after midnight. A few hands in, we've got Ace-10 offsuit in the hijack, the straddle's on, under the gun plus one limps in for 10. We have no choice but to isolate and destroy the opponent. I hate having to do it, but it's mandatory to punish limpers. I raised a 50. We're not actually going to be isolating the limper. The button calls. He's the only one though. Under the gun plus one folds. It's heads up and we're out of position. The flop comes a7-6 with two diamonds. We've got top pair and a backdoor straight draw. I'm feeling good about it. We should have the best hand a lot of the time. I bet 50 again. The button quickly reaches for chips and makes the call without really thinking about it. A quick call is usually indicative of a draw of some sort. The fact that he didn't even consider raising makes me rule out hands like two pair or better. The turn is the nine of diamonds, giving us a straight draw, but the flush draw gets there, and some straights get there as well. Plus, ace nine now has us beat. I check for pot control purposes and to see what the button wants to do. Once again, he acts quickly with a check back. This makes me feel much more confident about our hand. The opponent likely would have bet any flush or straight, and probably would have taken some time to at least consider betting two pair. I get the sense that he has a one pair hand like nine eight, or a worse ace. The river is the eight of hearts, giving us the 10 high straight. Based on our timing tells, coupled with the action, we can feel good about betting for value without having to worry that we're beat. I go with the large sizing of 200 to target two pair hands, or potentially the low end of the straight. This should look strange after checking the previous street when the flush draw got there. I'll rarely ever have a flush, yet I'm betting pretty big anyway. The button is trying to piece together the story that we're telling. I have to admit, it looks a little fishy. Ultimately, the button doesn't believe us. He calls. We give him the bad news. Straight. He's fine. You're low end. We straight over straight the opponent to get the session started out on the right foot. We're already winning and we're looking to expand. We pick up pocket aces in middle position after hearing people randomly shout roll tide several times without being prompted. I raise a 20. The cutoff calls. The button calls. Then the small blind, three bets to 130. This could get very interesting. We're playing super deep. There's over 500 big blinds in our stack and the small blind has us covered. After taking a moment to just enjoy this feeling of getting three bet while we have the best possible hand, I lay down the hammer with a four bet to 340. A couple of players get caught in the crossfire. The cutoff folds, the button folds as well. The small blind has a decision to make. I don't get the sense that he three bet me light like I initially suspected. We're so deep and I only made it about two and a half times the size of his three bet, so he could reasonably call with any pocket pair to try and set mine, then stack us. That's not what's gonna happen. After about a full minute, 
the opponent shockingly folds pocket queens face up. <laughs> For the vlog, you, we got nits over in the... In the nice uh, fold, man, nice fold. We got nits in uh, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently we do got some nits in Mississippi. I don't know if I'm happy or mad about the fold. He kind of owns me with it, but if you hit a set, I have over 2,000 more behind that would have been deposited directly into his stack. 10 minutes later, we get called for the 5-10-25 game. I'm excited to play higher stakes. I've heard about how wild the action can get for a long time, especially in the bigger games. I'm finally in a position to see firsthand what high stakes in Mississippi is all about. There's a lot of money on the table. We add on for another 2,000. We're in for 4,600 total on the day. Our first straddle, we look down at Queen Jack offsuit under the gun. The cutoff raises to 75. If you look hard enough, you can see a blurry Andrew Nemi in the distance. He's in the one seat on the dealer's left, firing as well. Our hand is too good to abandon. We defend our straddle and call for 50 more. It's heads up, we're out of position. The flop comes ace king 10 with two diamonds. We've got the nuts with a backdoor royal flush draw. The people are so kind out here, they give us a very nice welcome to the table. I check. The opponent recognizes that we won't be very strong on this flop all that often because we would have 3-bet hands like pocket aces, pocket kings, ace king, and sometimes with pocket tens. He can accomplish a lot with a small bet. He only makes it 50. He can be doing this with a lot of really weak holdings as a bluff. I want to keep those weak hands in because maybe he'll double barrel while drawing dead. I'll save the check raise for the turn if it's a blank. I flat the 50 to keep our trap open. The turn is the ace of clubs, it pairs the board so it's not a blank at all. I check. The cutoff doesn't appear to be concerned about another ace coming out. He bets 175. He still could be bluffing, but he can also have plenty of full house combos. Check raising is a little sketchy at this point since we'll have so few full house combos in our range. If we raise, it opens us up to getting re-raised by all sorts of bluffs and we'd potentially have to fold our straight, which has a lot of value. I call the 175 to keep the opponent's bluffs in once more and to try to get to showdown without getting blown off of our hand, even though there are lots of bad river cards for us. The dealer puts out the deuce of clubs. This one's a blank unless the opponent has ace deuce or miraculously gets there with pocket deuces. I check one final time. I expect the cutoff to shut down a lot of his bluffs and check those back. We've called twice on a board that's very connected. We could certainly have plenty of trips combos. And even in this situation, we have a straight, yet the cutoff fires a third bullet for 450. We're never folding after underwrapping our hand on the previous two streets. This is a pretty big bet though. It's now a very real possibility that we're up against a boat. When I'm considering raising, I think about what types of hands would fire all three streets and still be able to call a check raise on the river. Full houses definitely would, or they'd re-raise. Some hands like trips might fold. I could potentially get called by ace queen or ace jack, but that's probably it. And we have removal to those hands. If the cutoff is bluffing, he won't be able to call a check raise anyway. The amount of hands that we're beating that will call a check raise seems like a thin slice of the opponent's range at this point. I call, anticipating that we've got the winner a good chunk of the time, but not always. The cutoff shows ace-queen offsuit, he flopped top pair with the gutter, then hit trips on the turn. We show him that we've got that beat. It's a weird run out for us, and we happen to be up against the very next best hand, so our check raise probably would have gotten called on the river. We still win several hundred, but sort of the minimum at the same time. It can just be dangerous getting greedy with the board pairing and having so many high cards out there. I'm okay with the outcome, though. Next, it's our turn for ace-queen. We're under the gun plus one. I raise the 60. There are quite a few interested customers. The button calls, who was the opponent in the last hand. He's out for revenge. The big blind calls, and the under the gun straddler calls as well. We're going four ways to the flop. It comes queen three deuce rainbow. We've got top top and a backdoor straight draw. Still, there are lots of other players in the hand. It checks to us. We're gonna be firing for value and to clear out the field. I bet 140. Maybe we'll win right now, or maybe we'll get one caller. I don't anticipate much more action than that. I'm very wrong. No one folds. The three opponents all call. I'm not even sure what to put everyone on. I imagine one player has a queen, and the rest either have straight draws or slow playing sets. The turn is another deuce, which I'm glad to see because it reduces the amount of set combos that we could have been up against, and there shouldn't be many deuces in my opponent's range, if any. It checks to me. I check for pot control purposes and to see how players will proceed going forward. The button checks back. I'm no longer concerned. He's going to have us beat. If nothing changes on the river, I'll only have to be worried about the big blind and the under the gun straddler. The dealer puts out the four of clubs. Pocket fours make a boat. Six five and ace five also get there. The big blind bets 225. 
It's a tiny sizing that I take at face value. It looks like he has a medium strength hand like a bad queen and is trying to get to showdown as cheaply as possible. Onto the gun folds, we won't be folding. We didn't put in the raise on the river in the previous hand that we went over, but we're putting one in here. I make it 600 to go. This is for pure value to get a hand like king queen or queen jack to call. The button folds, the action's on the big blind. He's got our number, it's 600, but he's not gonna call us maybe. He re-raises to 1600. What on earth is going on here? They say if you get check raised on the river, you should almost always fold because you're pretty much just gonna be up against the nuts. If you get three bet on the river, it's even more likely. I'm replaying the hand in my mind. I was so sure that the small river bet was a blocker. Now I'm wondering if he was trying to induce a raise with a hand like quad deuces or three or four is full. I don't think that we'd get re-raised by a straight, so I'm ruling that hand out, especially because we have removal to ace five. The opponent will never have queens full and actually should be concerned that we could have that hand because occasionally I might check turn with pocket queens, figuring that we'd be up against a lot of straight draws that wouldn't be able to call a turn bet, but may bluff river if they don't get there. I'm confused, but I go with my initial read that the opponent bets small with a medium strength hand and may now be attempting some kind of Hail Mary bluff. I call for a thousand more and we hear one of my favorite things. The opponent turned Queen 10 offsuit into an odd bluff and takes himself straight to Value Town. Our assessment of the situation is correct that the big blind bet small on the river to get to showdown cheaply, then for some reason decided to charge himself the maximum to get to showdown. We win a big pot even for the stakes we're playing tonight. Our stack climbs almost 8,000. We win some small pots before picking up 10 9 of spades under the gun plus 1 at 317 in the morning. I raise a 60 from the absolute bottom of our range. The cutoff calls. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes queen eight seven with two diamonds and a spade. We've got an open ender with a backdoor flush draw. When we're playing out of position, we're gonna be checking a lot more instead of sea betting. I check here to see how the cutoff wants to play this. He's not giving us a free card. He bets 75. We didn't check with intentions of folding. After grabbing a few green chips, we call. Maybe we can spike the six of hearts one time. The dealer puts out the king of clubs, not a card I'm too happy about. I check. If the cutoff fires again, we're going to have to fold. There are only three really clean outs for us because even if we hit a jack, we can still get straight over straighted by ace 10, though that's not all that likely. The cutoff checks back, giving us an opportunity to drill the river. That's what we do. We get the six of diamonds, giving us a straight, but the flush draw gets there as well. If we check, nearly all worse hands in ours will check back. And we'll be calling a bet anyway, even if we're beat. We can't let the worst hands in ours that might call a bet off the hook. I bet 250 for value. If we get raised, we can consider folding. In fact, that's likely what we'll do. Although we've already seen that raises and re-raises out here aren't necessarily what they seem. We don't have to worry about it. The cutoff calls. We show them that we got there on the Mississippi River. The cutoff can't beat us. There's no one that's really been able to tonight. We're running good and doing everything that we can do to extract as much value as possible outside of the Queen Jack hand. We've got 8,700 in front of us. We're up over 4,000 on the session. Here we look down at Jiggity's on the button. The hijack raises to 75. We're playing seven-handed, so he's the second player to act pre-flop. We can mix in calling or three betting. In this instance, we call, it's heads up, and we're in position. The flop comes ace-10-6 rainbow. Not exactly what we were hoping to see, but the hijack checks. I can't be sure that we're not getting trapped, and there aren't too many worse hands that will call a bet. I check back. The turn is the seven of hearts. The opponent checks again. It's unlikely that he's got an ace or better. Usually in these types of scenarios, we'll be up against a second pair type of hand, like King-10 or Queen-10. If that's what the opponent's holding, his hand has value, so he doesn't need to turn it into a bluff, but he wants to get to showdown without putting much more money in the pot, so he checks with hopes of not getting blown off of it. We can beat pairs of 10s, and our hand is slightly under -repped. I bet 100 for value. It also gives us control of the pot. The opponent isn't scared. He calls. Perhaps he could have a draw of some sort in addition to second pair type of hands. The river is the four of hearts completing the backdoor flush draw. The hijack checks. A big part of me wants to bet against small to target those same hands we were targeting on the turn, but just in case we're up against a flush, pocket kings or pocket queens, I'm not gonna bet, but I let the opponent know that we have the winner if he has what I think he has. I have a 10 beat. I'll check. I don't have that beat. The opponent has pocket queens. Our read was mostly correct that our opponent had second pair. Unfortunately, he has one of the two second pairs that are better than our jiggities. There's obviously no right way to play him. 
we at least lose close to the minimum, not three betting preflop pays off. By us not having to pay off more. Six minutes later, we're dealt ace jack offsuit in the big blind. The cutoff raises to 60. The small blind calls, we can actually fold or call. Studies have proven that calling is at least seven times more fun. We call, the under the gun straddler also calls. We're going four ways to the flop. The dealer puts out ace jack six with two hearts. We've got top two pair and a multi-way pot. The small blind checks, we check, expecting the preflop raiser to occasionally bet. Under the gun checks, the cutoff is a giant disappointment to some YouTube viewers he's never met, and he checks back. Everyone gets to see a free one. The turn is the seven of diamonds. It's pretty much a blank. The small blind takes it upon herself to bet 75. Unless she's got pocket sevens or pocket sixes, we're gonna have the best hand. I raise the 250 for value. We don't want anyone behind to have an opportunity to call a relatively small bet with a draw and get there on us. We needed to make it more. Surprisingly, the under the gun player isn't immediately folding. He cold calls the raise. Maybe he has a worse two pair or a combo draw of some sort. He'd almost definitely re-raise with a set of sevens or sixes, so I'm ruling those types of hands that are beating us out. The cutoff folds. The small blind likes the price that she's getting. She calls for 175 more. She won't have a speed either. Three of us are still in, and we've gotta be best going into the river. The dealer puts out the eight of diamonds. Some straights get there, but I'm not all that worried about straight draws completing when there are flush draw possibilities out there. It'd be pretty ambitious for someone to call a raise on the turn with 10-9 or 5-4 unless they also had hearts. I doubt either opponent would have 9-5 either. The small blind checks. Missed draws won't be able to call a bet at any size. I'm going to target worst two pair hands like A7, A6, 7-6, 8-6 six of hearts, and 8-7 of hearts. I bet 900, liking the run out that we got. Under the gun is in a tank for a while. If he just calls, we almost for sure have him beat because he'd obviously raise with 10-9 and perhaps even with 5-4. Ultimately, he tosses in a calling chip. I'm pretty excited about it. The small blind takes a little bit of time before eventually folding. We turn over our top two pair. The opponent turns over a set of sixes. I wasn't expecting to see that. I'm glad we didn't get re-raised on the turn because we could have lost a lot more money. The deck set us up to lose a good chunk there, and we did, but it could have been much worse for us. After losing a few pots and being down from the high point, I'm ready to call it a night and leave with what's still a sizable win. Played for four hours. I won 2,500. Uh, we got the $1,200 main event tomorrow, so excited about that. First day in here, took a nap and then uh, played some top golf with everybody. Wasn't really necessarily planning on playing a session or filming, but uh, really happy to come out of there with a win and uh, excited for the rest of the trip too. After getting a little rest, we fire in the $1,200 main event that gets a phenomenal turnout of 1,074 players. The guarantee was 500,000, which is smashed. The total prize pool ends up being 1,127,000. On day one, I run up a decent stack of three times what I started with, but I can't get anything going beyond that, and eventually all the chips you see here disappear before we're able to make the money. The good news is that busting out of the tournament frees me up to play more cash games on the trip. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it. If you hit the like and subscribe buttons, it helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. Um, next episode, we're back at the Beau Rivage in, uh, in Biloxi and uh, play some more cash games and the session gets even wilder. So um, that's gonna be really cool. Uh, be sure to check out the launch, relaunch week going on now february 17th through the 25th and uh yeah man it's we're just playing some massive high stakes games i've filmed this outro before i played any of the sessions um at the lodge so if i if i look like i'm getting just absolutely crushed uh don't worry about me i mean hopefully that's not the case hopefully i win but uh yeah i'll be all, i'll be all right i've kind of emotionally and mentally prepared for potentially getting wrecked, but um, I've been doing a lot of studying with uh, my my uh, coach, Nick Petrangelo, and um, just trying to get things like tightened up so I can play my best. 
Uh, <clears throat> going out to Vietnam for the Triton series. Uh, I have more information in the description box below for that. And then going out to Cambodia for two weeks with WPT. So I have a link to that trip with um, tournament schedules and all that stuff. And if we get the details down for the meetup game before I put this video out, then I'll have that in the description box below. All right, guys, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. My apologies to Mike Mattisau and um, good luck at the tables.